maybe we should get started. Um, this is our sixth Aliens Among Us webinar Q&A hosted by the Invasive Species Council. I'm the CEO of the Invasive Species Council, Andrew Cox, and welcome everybody. I'm coming to you today from Darak and the Gundungara, Gundungara country and uh, the traditional lands of that land. I'm just here some heavy rain just out the window too. I uh, want to pay my respects to elders past present and the indigenous people who are with us today. Um, so uh, um, Aliens Among Us, this is where we get a chance to sort of explore some really interesting um, topics about uh, invasive species. And our special guest today is Sarah Corcoran. I'll introduce you her, her in a second, but first I might just uh, welcome the panel who's joining me. We've got Christine Milne, uh, Invasive Species Ambassador. Hello, Christine. Hi, Andrew. We've got Tim Lowe, who's a co-founder. Uh, he wrote a book of the feral future that led to a, our formation. So he's a co-founder of the Invasive Species Council, uh, still is a writer and biologist. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Andrew. Great to be here. And we would normally have Richard Swain, our Indigenous ambassador, joining us, but he's not available this week. But in his place, I'm really privileged to have Eli Perry, who's um, who's comes from the was based at uh, Minjeriba, uh, an island just off Brisbane, and he represents the Kwandamuka Ulabarabi Aboriginal Corporation. Welcome, Eli. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be here. <clears throat> Great. All right, as I mentioned, our special guest today is Sarah Corcoran. We normally would have a, an author of a, of a book about invasive species in the past um, features, but Sarah has this very distinguished career, um, which includes a big part of invasive species and, and particularly fire ants is an ant that seems to have featured a big part in her career. Um, she, Sarah's has a really interesting background and you're going to learn a bit more about that today um, and she's been um, had multiple awards for her work um, including including the Kim Rittman award um, a biosecurity award for science and innovation uh, so she really has uh, excelled in her career right now she's the CEO of Plant Health Australia which is the organization that gets us ready for the next big uh, disease that could impact on our livestock industries in Australia. Over 35 staff, and uh, I've um, I've worked for quite a long time um, with Sarah over the years uh, in multiple roles. Actually, I first met Sarah when I went to a fire ant conference in the United States in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and. Uh, we shared uh, a conference room together all about fire ants. So that's why, what's one of the big reasons why Sarah's here? She's got some great stories about biosecurity. Maybe we can get underway, Sarah. I'd love to uh, hear about your early career um, and how fire ants were a big part of that. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me here today and, <laughs> with you and the panel. And what a fantastic opportunity for me to share experience uh, that I've gained over the years. And I'm always delighted to be able to speak about biosecurity, particularly um, and telling people about what my experience has been and, and what I've learned along the way. Um, so my, my fascination for the natural sciences was there from a very young age. And I was always interested in, in the environment around me. I was fascinated by native flowers and native fauna. And, um, and I was a budding taxonomist, I guess, was uh, what became apparent. And that, that led me to a degree at James Cook University. And oh, I'm trying to already. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I was having some issues in the background. Um, and 
and learning more about biology and in particular entomology. So uh, my first job out of university was as a research assistant for the United States Department of Agriculture, who had a lab in, the, in um, Townsville in North Queensland. And there was research underway to try and find a biocontrol agent for Melaleuca quinquinervia, a native Australian species, which is still causing havoc in the Florida Everglades and really disrupting that environment in the US. So um, we were tasked with looking for a, an Australian species insect or pathogen uh, that would curb the, um, the vigour of all of these melaleucas that were growing in the US. And I saw a side of biosecurity that was, it was flipped for us in terms of, you know, Australia, the bastion of um, good biosecurity, good quarantine measures. And I saw it from another angle of a country dealing with an invasive, for them, what was an invasive species. And they put so much um, uh, uh fanfare around it that when we did have the release of a biocontrol agent and it was a, a, a beetle species, a weevil called Oxyops, it was actually accompanied by Al Gore, who was the vice president at the time, out to the Everglades um, with a big cavalcade. So that's an indication of just how seriously they took that program. Uh, and from there, my career went on and, um, and I became a researcher with the Defence Department of Defence and researching malaria and arboviruses. Um, so again, bringing that combination of entomology and um, the impacts that it has this time in the public health sense. And from there, I took those entomological skills that I'd gained along the way in research and applied them in an operational context as a scientist uh, with the AQUIS, Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service, as it was at that time. And, um, and within my first three weeks of being in that job, which was my most favourite job, I would have to say, over the years, simply because it's an entomologist's um, dream with the amount of, of species that you get to see and, and have the um, responsibility for identifying and trying to work out what they were. It was in that role when I first came up against fire ants. Right. Gosh. So you were there right from the start. Um, yeah. Yes, I am very proud to claim that um, I was the first person to identify reefer from Fishman Islands from that in infestation that was at the port of Brisbane. When you say reefer, what do you mean? Red imported fire ant, sorry. Good, thanks, Sarah. Okay, well, let's just, uh, I think fire ants has probably uh, had a bit to do with other uh, the rest of the panellists' um, experience. Um, Christine and Christine first, maybe, and, and Tim. Um, have you had, uh, Christine, what's, what's your first um, experience or encounter with fire ants? Can you, can you remember? Uh, well, I, I live in Tasmania and uh, so we don't have fire ants or I hope we don't have fire ants. We haven't had any that have been um, identified and detected. So I didn't know much about fire ants until I was elected to the Senate and I took my place in July 2005 and immediately joined the Rural and Regional um, Transport Committee of the Senate. And of course, the fire ants had first been detected uh, in Brisbane about 2001. So it was, there was a real understanding uh, that this was a major issue for Australia. It was something that that committee needed to be aware of. So the very first engagement I had in that rural and regional committee, which was dominated by Liberal and National Party senators, I have to say, was Queensland because we had citrus canker uh, in Emerald and we had fire ants, uh, the whole fire ant episode. And so that was really my introduction to it was at a political level, the, the awareness of just how serious this first incursion of fire ants had been. And so over the years, I've been very conscious of the impact and watched the impact of fire ants. And of course, the media at the time uh, from that 2001 uh, episode was just uh, wall to wall in Queensland about finding further nests and were there any more problems. And I think, Tim Lowe, you've got some um, some examples of the ads of those early days. Yeah, let's go to Tim. Tim, you're on mute. So do you want to come on off mute? Um, tell us about your first exposure to fire ants. Yeah, well, I was interviewed by a TV crew soon after they came out and they gave me a 
location where they'd been. So I was able to go and get stung by some um, just to feel what it was like. And I mean, it's very mild sting, but oh, it just didn't go away. It was it was really really creepy just from one single ant. So yeah, the uh, I wouldn't want to get those mass stings that people get. But yeah, it was amazing how we would get these huge articles in the Korea Mail. And then I would travel down to um, Sydney and Melbourne and um, people people down there hardly knew sort of what fire ants. Oh, yeah, maybe I've heard of those. And, I mean, they're taxpayer. I mean, they're, you know, this is a nationally funded operation. So uh, someone in Melbourne and Sydney's, you know, their tax dollars are going into the operation and, there, there are hardly any awareness. I mean, I think you couldn't have that now that newspapers have declined and everything's yeah. online. But, but you know, you're always getting these maps showing um, the new, new precincts where they've been found, uh, brochures in the letterbox. I remember my neighbour running in with, is this, is this a fire? Is this a fire? And everyone assumed they were big. People couldn't get over the idea that being bad when you're an ant actually means tiny, that all these bad invasive ants, they're, they're much smaller than the green ants that you're used to getting in the lawn. And the government actually didn't help because the first photos they sent out to us, they photographed dead ants in alcohol that were all bloated and they just didn't look right. And so, um, yeah, and, yeah, you know, used to seeing signs. Well, I still, I still see signs at the side of roads. I've seen signs above the highway. Um, and yeah, letterbox uh, drop offs, for, uh, you know, under um, open days you could go to. It was a huge cultural phenomenon that I think um, people just couldn't grasp what it was like if you hadn't lived through it. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, just before I come to Eli, I just have to remind us, everybody, this is not just a, a one way conversation, this is a QA. And if you want to make, uh, ask a question or put a comment in, but particularly questions, don't use the chat chat function at the bottom of the screen, use the Q&A function. That's where you must ask your questions. Uh, just um, pipe up with uh, what's on your mind, uh, respond to what you're hearing, and then we'll, I'll, uh, as we go, call out the, the questions that seem to be the most relevant for the time. So please use the Q&A function. Eli, I guess your uh, exposure to fire ants is a little bit more recent than Tim and Carol. <coughs> Tell us a bit about when you first heard about fire ants? Um, I can remember hearing about them a lot when I was younger and whatnot. And, but I actually had a run in with them. I've done a bit of work on the mainland in different construction fields and stuff. And I got bitten, oh, I was probably two or three years ago. I was in Rochdale, there's a few nests around that area. And um, I was doing something standing in an area and just had a few run up my leg and, and got bitten by a couple and sort of thought, hmm, they hurt, you know, like um said earlier, quite mild, but I could tell that, you know, I'd never seen them before. So I just went and seen the foreman and he confirmed that they were fire ants. So they got DPI out to spray them and whatnot. Yeah, right. Well, um, we'll, come, we'll come in a minute to your, how they've um, arrived on Minjiraba, but um, I might just come back to Sarah. Thanks, thanks Eli. Um, because we're starting to get a bit of a feel for, for these ants. They are, uh, uh, you know, red fire ants originally uh, come from South America. They uh, were accidentally spread to the Southern US um, at a port at Alabama uh, in the mid thirties, uh, maybe the early thirties. And um, they didn't really get on top of them. Um, and then now they've, covering large parts of the southern US and they've uh, made it their, their way to Australia. So we'll, we'll cover that off in a minute. Maybe I might ask Sarah, um, can you just talk a bit about why they're such a nasty ant and sort of some of the some of the reasons why we should be really fearful of this tiny, tiny ant? Sure. Absolutely. And um, they, they've originated from the Pantanal region in South America and Brazil. You rightly um, mentioned there, Andrew. So they are the ultimate pioneer species. And I respect them greatly as, as an insect. They are amazing in terms of their ability to survive. They can survive through drought. They can survive through floods. They can survive through cold. Um, you know, they, no climatic barrier seems to deter them. 
um, hence why they are such a significant threat. And Australia considers them a pest of national significance because of that. Their impacts will be felt across our native flora and fauna, um, particularly with ground dwelling species that um, either produce eggs or, you know, had their young are born on the ground. The ants, if they're there, will consume them very quickly. They will overcome and overpower. They also impact, um, you know, the, the plant life in terms of nibbling on roots, uh, picking up seeds and, you know, they're, they're constantly foraging for food and so, and they eat just about anything. Um, so yeah, they have a very broad ranging diet. And in Australia, we've been so fortunate in terms of having an eradication program in place because we haven't, we haven't sensed or felt those impacts. It was in the early days of uh, their detection when those impacts were felt by people, hence why they were reported. Um, and in the case where I was given the task of trying to identify them, it was because the, the workers that were maintaining gardens at a visitor centre down at Fisherman Islands had been stung persistently for 12 months and they were just over uh, being stung to pieces by these ants. One of those workers was hospitalised, unfortunately, in that case. Um, but that's what brought them to their attention. And, um, and hence, now we know that we have reefer. Uh, also, the Richlands detection in the early days, same sort of story where the ants had got to a level and were impacting a uh, household and the people that lived there struggled to hang their washing out on the washing line they had to hop across the kids trampoline to get to the washing line so that they weren't uh, consumed by the ants in their yards they saw their veggie patch just become overrun um, so yeah the impacts to people's everyday lives is something that we are yet to have an experience and that has been because there has been a dedicated eradication program in place and that eradication program is obviously still going and still has work to do, but there have been eradications of the ants in locations in Yarwin, uh, up around Gladstone twice. Um, we've seen the Fishman Islands uh, population be eradicated. There was a, an incursion at the airport also eradicated and also the Port Botany incursion and most recently in the Port of Fremantle. So there, are, there is success that, to be had. Um, it's just the dedication and the effort required to do it. And, and in terms of people's awareness, just coming back to some of those earlier comments around, mm. do, people, do people know about fire ants? Well, um, the program has done a very good job at raising awareness in southeast Queensland. And, and Tim's right, you know, um, we would always have a stand at the ECA and people would come up to the stand and we'd have a, a, an aquarium with fire ants in it. And the first thing they would say is, oh, well, they're, they're not as big as what I thought they were. And they're not red. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there, there was this whole impression by the public that they were this monster ant that was going to grab you kind of thing. But they are just a, um, a really resilient species that can survive and establish in, well, more than half of the world is what's been um, considered. And yeah. for Australia, they would establish in most parts. Thanks, Sarah. Look, we'll explore a bit more about what's happened since the um, the detection and the and the eradication program. And that's a really good good uh, uh, sort of summary of why we should fear them. Christine, um, you mentioned at the start that you're in Tasmania and um, that um, you know you you were even worried as a Tasmanian about them. Talk about why you should be so worried as a Tasmanian and why people in other parts of Australia should be also worried. Well, I think people, because the focus has largely been on Queensland, there has been an assumption that maybe they only thrive in a tropical climate or in a warmer climate or something like that. But in reality, the science, and Sarah, you could probably comment on this, but the science shows that they could because they can survive heat and cold and flood and drought and so on, virtually all of Australia is vulnerable to an invasion of these ants. So given that if you accept that Tasmania is as vulnerable as anywhere else, 
of course, all of our, uh, or the overwhelming majority of our trade comes through our ports. And of course, that means shipping containers. And shipping containers have been uh, one of the ways in which these ants have spread. And so Tasmania is as vulnerable as anywhere else because of the because of our trade in the shipping containers. And that means that the ports, there needs to be surveillance in Tasmania around our ports, just as, well, anywhere, but especially in the ports, just as there has been uh, elsewhere. The other thing uh, I'd want to mention in this, and Sarah again might want to comment, I was fascinated by the um, floods in Queensland and stories that emerged of these ants, and Sarah did mention how what an extraordinary creature they are, form the rafts um, so that they survive, but then in vast numbers they can move anywhere where the floodwaters uh, are flowing and take them which really brings the implication back in terms of funding of surveillance, because after these mega floods on the mainland, you'd have to assume that you'd have to have surveillance in a much larger area than previously. So I think that's the main point about Tasmania, Andrew, that um, we are as vulnerable as anyone else. The impacts that Sarah mentioned, it's not only lifestyle in terms of kids playing in the backyard and they can't play and they can't hang up the washing and you can't grow a veggie patch it's also livestock uh, it has a huge impact on livestock um, but also again the native ecosystem because it's ground nesting birds it's lizards it's uh, they even will access trees to get up into bird hollows and the like so yeah. the impact on the ecosystem is huge as well so I just mm. think people need to start getting into their head about the different ways these animals move. Thanks. Yeah, look, I might come to Tim in a second, but first of all, I just remind everybody we're in Aliens Among Us webinar hosted by the Invasive Species Council. I'm Andrew Cox, the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. And we've got um, our featured guest today is Sarah Corcoran, who heads up Plant Health Australia, and our <laughs> panellists are Christine Milne, uh, Invasive Species Council ambassador, Tim Lowe, our co-founder and uh, author of Feral Future and Eli Perry, who is in Minjeriba, an island just off from Brisbane and um, part of the Quayok Aboriginal Corporation and an Indigenous man himself. So um, I just, uh, there's a question that's just come in, just reminding people, post your questions in the Q&As. Um, someone who lives in South Australia was worried that they could come down via the Murray and as Christine mentions about the rafting propensity of these ants, that's totally possible if they could get into that catchment, the Murray Darling catchment. And the ants are kilometers away from that, the top of that catchment. I don't think they're quite in there yet, but they're in the Lockyer Valley to the west of Brisbane. So if we don't stop them spreading into the upper reaches of the Murray Darling Basin, yes, they could come down rafting the Murray Darling River. So that would be quite horrendous while we need to stop them spreading. I might just come to Eli for a second because we just talked about the movement of the ants. And uh, uh, Eli, do you want to talk about what you heard a few, about a month ago, uh, or what you you were the report about fire ants on Minjeriba went and just talk a bit about uh, what happened there and uh, what the response was, um, what the latest is on on fire ants on Minjeriba. Yeah, we were. Um... Just going about normal business on a daily basis, our range of duties, and got a call saying that a nest had been located just to the southern end of Dunwich. Um, went and had a look, and they had it. People were there. They identified them, confirmed that it was indeed fire ants. Um, sprayed that site. Um, then we done searches of the immediate area. And within, um, I think it was 500 metres, we found about 19 more nests and sectioned them off, sprayed all them, searched, I think, and then the next, we searched within two kilometres or two and a half kilometres of the original nest site, um, all through town, didn't find any more nests. So we're hoping it was just, the original 19 that we found in the 500 metres, they didn't get any further. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah. That's, 
That's scary. I might, I might come to you in a minute um, back, back just to talk more about, about that, um, but I might just come to Tim. Um, we've just touched on some of the environmental impacts Christine just mentioned, what it means for small mammals. Do you want to talk a bit more about why we should be worried about it from an environmental point of view about fire ants? Yes. Um, I was just reading an article this morning about Florida where, you know, the spread from Alabama to Florida. This comment, most sea turtle nesting beaches in the southeastern United States are now infested with fire ants. I mean, that is just staggering that, you know, with green turtles, loggerheads and so on, they're hauling themselves up onto the beach in um, in Florida. Their, their eggs, the um, fire ants, when the turtles are hatching, um, it can take quite a while. And the fire ants are very good at getting down into the nests of any reptile eggs, so lizards, snakes, turtles, including freshwater turtles. I mean, just the idea that um, most sea turtle nesting beaches in, in the United States have now got fire ants. So um, the implications for a, a highly invasive ant spreading over vast distances of Australia, it's a bit hard to comprehend how much they can do. I mean, they don't like thick vegetation, so we're not talking about a problem in rainforest or really dense forest, but um, you know, a lot of... Um, well, you know, Stradbroke Island, a lot of the sandy soil where it's a bit more open. I mean, I mean, a dense national a dense national park could still have problems around the campgrounds, walking trails, fire trails, and with fire management. So if you're burning, say, you think of the Blue Mountains, where if it's really dense vegetation, uh, fire ants could have difficulty there. But where you've got um, burnt areas, they're going to be able to colonise those. And that's certainly the situation in the United States where where they are getting them mostly in disturbed ground, so footpaths, sporting fields, but in um, habitats like pine woodlands that burn regularly, they're able to occupy those. And, yeah, as Sarah was talking about, um, you know, ground nesting, um, ground nesting birds, yeah, plains, plains wanderers, you know, highly endangered bird. We've got all sorts of lizards. We've got more than 20 species of earless dragon, very small distributions. It's just going to have massive overlap with these really fiercely stinging ants that will sting them. Um, all these small marsupials on the ground, they can get blinded around their eyes. And it might not kill a lot of these animals, but if they're in... Um, you know, if, if they're stung, then their capacity to find prey is limited. Their ability to evade predators is not as good. So uh, in the southeastern United States, they're talking about reduced population densities of a very wide range of ground-dwelling birds and reptiles and, and some mammals. So um, who knows how far that will go in Australia. I don't think we fully know yet, do we, because I don't think the studies have been properly done, but we know that the costs Financially, I think, um, Sarah, I've seen figures um, um, in the US that they, the direct costs of treatment and impacts is something like $7 billion each year on the US economy. So in Australia, it's going to be something of that magnitude. Sarah, um, maybe talk a bit about how we actually get rid of them. There's a question that's come through. How do you, what, what are the identifying features of fire ants? But if you, um, maybe as you answer that, you might talk about um, the eradication program because um, for your sins, um, being an entomologist, um, you were thrown into the deep end and actually were in charge of the fire ant program. I think just after that, uh, or just before that port botany outbreak in Sydney, um, that you were heading up the eradication program um, centered on the Brisbane outbreak. Do you want to talk a bit about well, not what the fire ants look like, but also um, the challenges of being head of the eradication team and what it's like for those people trying to do the eradication? Yeah, it was 2014 when I um, took on the role of leading the national red imported fire ant eradication program. And um, you're right, Andrew, it was a similar timing to when those ants were detected in Port Botany. And people's immediate reaction was, well, they've moved. They've come down from Queensland. This will be ants that have moved from Brisbane into Sydney. And fortunately, because we had have had and still do have a program in place that is invested in what techniques and tools are needed in eradication of a pest species such as fire ants, there was the genetics available to us and we were able to quickly determine that it was a new introduction. 
And that technique has been really, really important to us over the years and one that we built in collaboration with the US from their learnings. Uh, it's allowed us to work out population assignments so whether or not something is a new incursion or whether it's related to those populations that are here. It's allowed us to see that there's been a decline in the vigour of the fire ants that are in southeast Queensland and because that's due to the pressure being applied to them with eradication and they've become quite inbred uh, and showing, a, a, you know, males are showing sterility. So that's a really positive sign that the techniques are working. Um, so, yeah, the genetic side of it is a, is a really key tool in the um, eradication of them. The, the way that you tell fire ants is fairly straightforward and you'll know if you've bumped into them, um, particularly if they get disturbed because they will bubble to the surface like a volcano in terms of numbers they react very quickly and they will look to attack whatever is disturbing their their nest and their nests are unlike Australian native species they don't have an entry or an exit hole as such um, you know like you might see with a, a big bull ant nest or um, meat ant nest they they just have a, a mound of dirt on the surface and that's actually their solar panel for incubating their young and bringing them through for the next generation. Um, but if that dirt, and it's often, it'll just look like, particularly if you, if it's on grass in a, in a, a maintained area, it'll just look like a little um, clump of dirt that's been put on the surface. But if you bump it, um, the ants will tell you very quickly that they're there and they will want you to leave. Sarah, the challenging thing about these nets is often particularly in winter, you may not even see them. And um, so that's, you know, it's, it's not necessary. And one of the questions sort of raising this point around, you don't necessarily treat around the known colonies. Um, you really, the, the, the difficulty is treating in areas where you think the ants are, but trying to make sure you don't miss any of the ants nests that you can't even see. So that yep. must be a horribly difficult job. And maybe that's why this costs so much want to talk about that it's a massive challenge um and you're right you know there, there needs to be application of the bait uh, in this case it's an insect growth regulator that prevents the female the queen from producing more young so eventually the colony will die out but it's a slow death and it's not necessarily a you know apparent at the time but the the actual delimitation of where the ants are is the first step to working towards getting rid of them um, and hence, as the uh, area of operation has grown over the years in southeast Queensland, the challenge has become greater. And um, and so everyone has a part to play in this eradication effort. You know, we all share the responsibility because people need to report. They need to um, very much report them if they're in a new new spot where they haven't been detected before but also where they currently are because bait application is necessary there's also that um, need to detect them in areas that aren't as densely populated as what some of our um, city locations are so um, you know using the aerial ability of remote sensing and um, that again was another uh, development by the program nowhere else in the world had done that in terms of military grade helicopter um, cameras underneath helicopters taking imagery of large tracts of land particularly in those agricultural areas that you were describing earlier you know disturbed land masses where the ants are likely to be establishing because that's the style of environment that they like um, so yeah, really important to have other tools available. And of course, the human element, um, really key, uh, not only from de the detection and treatment point of view, but also working with the public, because again, it comes back to people being aware that this ant is a pest and that if they see it, they do need to report it and do something about it, because otherwise it will take us over. Yeah, I've been told that the, most of the detections nowadays are coming for, in the infestation area, are coming through from public reporting, which, which is excellent. And uh, there's a comment coming from Megan Wiley, who talks about her recollections of an Argentine ant program when she was um, young. I remember it when in my childhood, in, based growing up in Sydney, I think, and just reminding people the, the value of targeting children because they can also they can often be the ones who notice things that. Uh, might be under our nose. Um, so I, 
I can understand that this program is can be so expensive. The the, the treatment area is roughly five hundred thousand hectares, um, sort of stretching from Brisbane, sort of south, almost to the New South Wales border, from the Gold Coast into the Lockyer Valley, as I mentioned. And that's an area roughly the twice the size of the ACT. So it's a huge area. And it's not surprising it's costing us all the money to treat all those areas using that uh, growth regulator bait sort of broadcast, what using planes, Sarah, and um, in your houses um, on the ground. Helicopters, yeah. Yeah, sorry, helicopters, yes, of course. Um, so, I'm thinking about the uh, the cost of all this. Um, I was proud to have led a campaign 2016, 17, to make sure that the program had the funds that they needed. A, an independent review said that they needed a lot more funds and there was a proposal to fund the program for 10 years at around about $400 million over those 10 years up until that point. They weren't really funding it in advance so they couldn't have staff on board um, who they could offer long-term contracts, contracts that were just months ahead of the time. So I found it hard to believe you can even run a program where you can't even guarantee, you know, paying your quality staff over a long period. So that was a major, uh, I guess, achievement of our organization that, that led to the government in 2017 committing $400 million for that 10 year program. But um, maybe I should ask Christine, um, what would you, what would you say if you were a minister, Christine, and you you had a someone walked into your office and said, "Look, uh, we need to uh, spend four hundred million dollars on this uh, big problem." Um, I mean, it's 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 highly relevant right now because what we're finding is actually the the, the funds that they have uh, aren't enough, and they is going to need to, need to be a, even in, an even larger proposal for funds. What would um, what would your reaction be, Christine, um, if you were the federal? Um, I guess in this case, agricultural minister. Well, I think everything's changed since the submarines, Andrew. We've got billions to spend uh, on prevention being better than cure. Um, 368 billion, in fact. So the money is no problem. I think it was uh, all of those military men have been saying recently, prevention is better than cure. We have to have the submarines. Well, I also quite seriously refer back to Tanya Plibersek saying um, that, a that the government simply doesn't have the money to invest in the environment and that's why she has proposed her nature repair market bill which is to set up a market to involve the private sector because the government doesn't have the money to protect the environment and so that's why I raised the submarines it's a matter of choice now in my view it is absolutely critical that we fund alien invasive species research and work on the ground to eradicate where we can and contain and try and draw back the boundaries where we can't eradicate. It's, it's very clear, and you mentioned before the US, and I looked that up myself, it is 6.7 billion US dollars a year they spend in the US, and that is they've calculated that in terms of the damage uh, that ants that the fire ants are doing, then the cost of the medical treatment because we've we've mentioned the stings and people have talked about um, the fact that it's a burning sting and it's uncomfortable, but people die from it as well. Anaphylactic shock is real when it comes to bites from fire ants. So you've got the medical treatment and then you've got the cost of the control efforts and then you've got any uh, environmental problems that come as a result of spreading these toxins in the environment. So there are all sorts of issues. Plus you have to retain people like Sarah and the researchers who've done all the work on the genetics and so on. If you lose that corporate knowledge, if you lose that experience, then you have to start all over again. And it's been essentially uh, a waste of having invested it because you're not using it. So in my view, Whatever it costs, and not just for fire ants, we've got exactly the same thing in Tasmania for feral deer. It's now a stitch in time. We either do it now or they're going to be out of control. And the same goes for so many other uh, alien invasive species and the crazy ants has been mentioned, any number of them. So in, from my point of view, Australians have to recognise um, alien invasive species, fire ants, as a security issue. Do we want to have 
a secure environment? Do we want to give our ecosystems a chance into the future? And obviously global warming is a huge pressure, but of course alien invasive species is a major driver of extinction. That's the fact of the matter. So when you come to think about the future of Australia and keeping us secure, I think you have to think in terms of keeping your ecosystems uh, secure and investment in alien invasive species uh, prevention and then management and hopefully eradication is well worth it. So uh, as Richard Dennis, I think from the Australia Institute said, no politician can ever say again, we can't afford it. What they can say is, is it, is it a priority? And that's where the community, in my view, has to really make this a priority by insisting to their local members and at elections that and ask for the policy on this because it is a choice. That's a point well made, Christine. And um, <clears throat> yeah, prevent prevention is certainly something that we um, know how beneficial it is. And um, just probably, um, I'm just looking at some of the questions. There's um, Ed Thexton from South Gippsland Conservation Society. He's been in contact with us just recently because his members have really got um, quite motivated to support our work on red fire ants, understanding the nature of the threat the, um, we've been worried that the um, the government sort of funding that this just to remind it's not just the federal government it's actually all of the states and territory governments are also contributing 50 percent federal government and then each of the states depending on their population because they're all going to be the recipients of this fire ant if we don't stop this um, program um, they're encouraging or well, they're encouraging uh, the Gippsland Conservation Society to support our campaign we're trying to We've just put on board a campaigner to agitate to make sure this extra funding that's needed, um, um, knowing that the funding is not good and not, not good enough at the moment, um, we're making sure that that funding actually comes forward. There's been a report that's been out for a year and a half now, and the governments haven't acted on that, and we're getting worried that this uh, this window is closing and it might slip out of our control. And once the ants get too far gone. We won't be able to eradicate them, and that's just a matter of time. They will spread to all of Australia, so it's getting very, very urgent. Um, as a quick, quick, quick um, just looking at some of the other questions, Susan Ring asked whether the detector dogs are used, and I think absolutely the answer is yes. I think they've got over twenty detector dogs being used. First that's eradication it. program in the world to utilise odour detection dogs. Yeah, excellent. Good. Um, we're, time's starting to um, beat us here. Um, I might just uh, pass, just ask Eli, because uh, uh, we're, we're lucky to have him uh, there um, and to share his experience on Minjiraba. Minjiraba is a pretty special island. Um, and I think it really highlights what is at stake if we can't get fire ants out of this big infestation um, in Southeast uh, Queensland. Uh, so Eli, Maybe you might want to share what your uh, hope and fears are here. Um, what's at stake and um, are you worried about the future? Yeah, well, it's not good, obviously. You don't want the ants on the islands. Um, would be quite upsetting to the lifestyle and obviously the native wildlife and everything like that. We have got some pretty special little animals and stuff over here. Um, are, you, yeah. are you hopeful? Yeah, well, we um, seems like we've got on top of that first um, invasion. Haven't really heard anything else. There haven't been any new nests located or anything like that. So that's looking good. And um, it takes a few years before you can actually confirm you've actually found them all because they could have been there for a little while and maybe even the queens could have spread and created a new nest nearby. Yeah, well, um, like I said, that you said earlier, I think um, about the genetic testing, they've done some of that and they confirmed that it's all just originated from the one nest, that first nest um, that was originally located. So, yeah, hopefully there won't be any more. Yeah, good. Thanks, Eli. Um, I, I might just come back to protect maybe uh, Tim or or even Sarah, because I know Sarah, your history is not just restricted to fire ants. Mm -hmm. Maybe I might start with you, Sarah. Um, we've touched on yellow crazy ants, and there's a question in, in the chat about that. Christine mentioned yellow crazy ants. 
is red fire ants the only ant we should be worried about? Is it the worst? Um, or are we just going to be copying it from different directions with different ants? We're just going to deal with them all. Uh, it's a great question, Andrew, and um, and there are other ant species at the moment that are under active eradication in far north Queensland. It is electric ant, or Wasmania aura punctata, and they're a, an interesting species because they are also arboreal. They'll get up in the trees, and that was the reason why they were initially detected was that they were raining down on a lady and her child in their swimming pool in their backyard in Cairns and stinging them. Um, they're, they're, they have similar impacts for fire ants, but they have different behaviours. They, they get to really large numbers in tree canopies and have uh, put paid to any sort of agricultural activities, particularly in the Pacific and uh, Hawaii, where they are a significant pest. Um, there's, of course, yellow crazy ant, which has that um, ability to produce mega colonies. They get in mass numbers and, again, overwhelm the um, particularly the ground dwelling species, but they're also very efficient climbers. They'll get up in trees and they they farm scale and gain their nutrition and then just power on even more, consuming the environment around them. Uh, there's browsing ant, again, a, a, a a species not well known, but known to be invasive around the world and was detected first in Western Australia and then in the Northern Territory has been under active eradication. Um, we saw mention there of Argentine ant, uh, another uh, species of ant that gets into these mega colonies. And um, so, yeah, there, there is much to be done and we do need to be vigilant. Ants are an extremely good hitchhiker and um, Christine was mentioning it earlier around container movements and uh, their ability to, to travel. They will, if there's enough soil on the underside of an imported piece of machinery or on the underside of a, a container or just even inside of it, um, that is the way that they get moved around internationally. So um, there's, there's always that need to be vigilant and monitoring where those ants are causing issues elsewhere in the world and what those pathways look like into Australia. You uh, must have understood that very well. You, um, your, your previous job was heading up uh, biosecurity in Northern Territory, right? So you, yeah. you know, a, a, a territory that doesn't have a lot of resources, but you're often on the receiving end of many, many different uh, outbreaks and uh, browsing ants was just one of many, right? It was, and um, and those guys are still working away at eradicating them up there. And, um, you know, the north of Australia really faces some unique biosecurity risks because of the ability, not only because of those, those trading um, patterns that have been established up there for, for thousands of years amongst the people, but also the, the natural pathway movements through monsoon activity and, um, you know, just the wind currents that blow pests and diseases onto our shores and um, you know the the regions in in those areas have a lot of urbanization around the um, the ports where things arrive there's also agriculture happening in those areas so there's a a really um, strong ability for things to establish quickly and yes the north is subject to that yeah great look we've only got 10 minutes left and just uh, there's some really good questions coming in through the q a and um just remember, use the Q and A, not the chat. Um, we've got some, um, yeah, really, you know, broad range of things. Maybe uh, if the panelists can just look at that, so when I come back to them, they can maybe answer some of the ones that are directed towards them. But um, we might just sort of look bigger picture because um, we started talking about the other ants. Um, and and Tim, you, I'm, I'm interested in your views about how we can um, really uh, deal with all of these. Uh, invasive ants, but also all the other invasive species threats. Um, I mean, this is uh, humans and in, in a globalized society, humans are just uh, moving around more and more now. And uh, um, and of course, we're, our global trade's just um, at the click of a button on the internet and you can have uh, something air freighted to you within a few days. Um, what's, what's, what are we facing here? What you're, I know you're updating feral future at the moment. Um, what are we, is the problem getting worse um, since you wrote feral future in 1999? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's massively worse. And I mean, my biggest problem is there's just too much to write about. What, what do you, what do you leave out? How can you possibly leave out this topic or that? But I don't want a book that's thicker than a, 
those telephone books in the old days. But, yeah, I think, you know, like globalisation, we humans have created a system to benefit ourselves, moving to move products around, move ourselves around, without it ever really comprehending the extent to which other species can exploit these systems of mobility that we've created, that, you know, when people sign free trade deals, they think, oh, this is going to benefit my country and that country. But there's the whole biota that is also going to benefit. You know, there's a whole lot of weeds and ants go, oh, yes, good, more more movement in that direction. Let's let's get aboard. And that we, we are not properly comprehending what is going on. And so um, I think it's interesting that when I was writing Feral Future, you weren't allowed to criticise globalisation. I mean, globalisation was just automatically good. It was going to raise all boats. Third world was going to benefit. Everyone was going to benefit. And now there's been a a big recognition that's not so. You've had uh, a politician at the level of Trump, you know, leader of America, saying globalisation has all these disbenefits. And so we've got the sort of questioning of that. Um, In terms of what do we do, I think... Australia is one of the lowest taxing of OECD countries. So when uh, Tanya Plibersek says we don't have enough money, part of the reason for that is just that we don't we're not taxed highly enough. So I don't know how we we uh, we change that. But but obviously there's, there's got to be a lot more awareness that Australians don't actually pay a lot of tax. Um, but also in terms of the, the way in which the uh, AUKUS agreement, the way in which defence is insulated from a low tax regime. We have to push the idea that we don't need to just defend ourselves against bad people overseas, but bad species overseas. That defence, getting that um, exemption from uh, tight funding regime, that's got to extend to biosecurity as well. It's, it's a natural extension. If if we're going to spend a lot on um, submarines and military defence, we should at the same, same time be spending a lot on defending ourselves against the species we don't want. Thanks, Tim. The defence of Australia, I, I like it. Um, I might just come back to Christine um, because um, I think this issue of priorities comes up and uh, I mean, I think what can we do around um, looking at the biosecurity threats Australia is facing? Um, Christine, do you want to yeah. comment? Look, I, I think that the uh, every of course what Tim says is right about globalization. But having said that, Australia has now reprioritized the Pacific. Now they're doing it, of course, for uh, defense and um, the geopolitical scenarios. But the Australia is reaching out to have much stronger ties with the Pacific. Now, one of the best things they could do in the Pacific, which is soft diplomacy, but it's essential for actually protecting ecosystems and life on Earth, is actually working with the Pacific on biosecurity because everything, well, not everything, but a lot of things that come to Australia come via the Pacific. So Myrtle Rust was a classic case. We knew it was coming. We knew it was in Hawaii. We knew, we knew, we knew, we knew, and it came. And it just frustrates me to death when I look back on that and I ask so much in the Senate, what are we doing about it? What are we anticipating? What are we doing? Oh, it's all right. We've got everything in place. Surveillance is in place. Well, we didn't have, and it got here. So my view is the geo- let's use the current geopolitics of Australia wanting to pivot to the Pacific to actually work on, on biosecurity in the Pacific, not military security, biosecurity, because they need it as much as we do and we can really help island communities and our neighbours. So I think that's really important. Second thing is we're in the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. A huge amount of money is being allocated all over the world, not in Australia, but all over the world towards ecosystem restoration and you can't restore an ecosystem without dealing with alien invasive species that are already in the ecosystem or indeed might be uh, threatening the ecosystem. So I think using the UN decade on ecosystem restoration to elevate the idea of alien invasive species in that context is really important in the national conversation. And then the third thing is citizen science. You know, a lot of people, not only do they want to do it in their own communities, but when they go on holidays, people love to get involved in weeding programs or in surveillance programs or just in, so they call it regenerative tourism, Mm. but actually there's a huge amount that could be done. So from my point of view, the community is really open to working out how to help 
and we just need to put on put some pressure on to have biosecurity elevated to the same status as military security. Great point, Sarah. Uh, sorry, Sarah. Christine, um, I might just before I wrap up and hand, hand it back to Sarah at the end, um, Eli, you're looking at things from the local level and Ninjerabar is, has these amazing uh, natural values. I know you're pushing for world heritage listing for your island. Um, do you want to just talk a bit about the other invasive species challenges you're facing, whether it's the, the foxes or the cats or, or the weeds? Yeah, we've got plenty of feral cats. Foxes are not too bad at the moment. They're pretty well on top of the foxes, I believe. Um, cane toads is another big one. Um, tilapia, I think they found tilapia in some of the mine, where it's been mined down the southern end of the island. Um, That's a tragedy. Not sure how far they've spread. I think they've only sort of found them in one one area. Mm. Um, Highly invasive fish, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, freshwater fish. So you've got a biosecurity program to keep uh, the island free of pests and weeds, or is that a, a, work, a bit of work to do that needs some support, support from uh, the local council and biosecurity Queensland? Yeah, it's a it's a work in progress. Um, yeah. Obviously, national parks, they do an feral animal control, the cats and foxes and stuff like that, Queensland Parks and Wildlife. Um, yeah. We've got a dedicated fella over here. He's he's also Indigenous. He does the feral animal control traps and yeah. euthanizes when he catches stuff and whatnot. Um, Excellent. All right. A lot of work ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Eli. I might just uh, wind up now with uh, Sarah. Sarah, I, I, you, you've got lots of hats. Uh, you've had lots of experience. Uh, I know you're involved with our Decade of Biosecurity Initiative. That's uh, a big partnership. Um, can you be hopeful about where we're heading? And um, I have to ask a question about whether you're hopeful about fire ants as well. Do you want to, what, where, where do you think about uh, what you just heard from the other panelists? Thanks, Andrew. I think the work that Eli's doing is really critical, particularly in that um, island sense where they, they are our last frontiers, where we can actually do something about preserving the biota and the biodiversity that exists on those island ecosystems. Um, so that is very much needs to be a strong focus um, in, in the sense of overall, you know, what does it mean? Should we continue to invest? We owe it to the future generations to, to continue this investment. We are yet to realise the full impact of, um, you know, these feral species, these, these aliens that live amongst us now. And it well and truly remains in the national interest for programs such as the Red Imported Fire Ant Eradication Program to continue. Um, we are so close to eradicating it and we would not want to lose that advantage. You know, we are the envy of the world when it comes to being in that position. No other country has achieved it. So we've got to keep going. We've got to keep investing. Otherwise, we're going to be facing significant bills in the future. And, um, you know, Christine described the, the economic impact in the US. The modelling for Australia shows that we would be facing a $1.65 billion bill a year if they were to become established and more widespread in Australia. Um, the modelling also showed that, you know, over the next 30 years, and this was early in the program, that we would be experiencing somewhere between a $45 billion impact. And I can only imagine that that figure has increased. Mm. Um, so, yes, very, very important that we don't lose the advantage that we've gained and the investment far outweighs the cost of a future with fire ants. Right. Thank you. That's a great way to wrap up. Sarah, it's been great to get to know you. And uh, look, we're just so grateful to have people like you beavering away in the background and at, actually in those leadership roles, uh, trying to keep us safe from whether it's a pest, a, a weed, an invasive species that's impacting on agriculture, our way of life or our environment. So thank you, Sarah, for uh, sharing that with us today. I want to thank the panellists, uh, Tim Lowe, Christine Milne, and Eli Perry, thanks for joining us and really loved your, uh, your insights and comments. And thanks for the audience for listening. We had some great questions. We'll aim to answer the ones we didn't get to today. Uh, this is Aliens Among Us. We're recording this, so it's on, on the web in a few days' time, so you can share it with your friends. We'll do another one of these in about 
uh, maybe about three to four months time, we're trying to do three to four a year. Um, we'll pick another topic. Um, really, thanks for, for joining us today and um, have a great day. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.